I always love giving talks after lunch because I get to wake you guys up a little bit um, and you're nice and full and warm. Um, thank you for the awesome intro. As mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Blendor. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the future of workforce talent and the impact that unconscious bias in particular has in the way that we evaluate um, talent in many different contexts. So the way I typically like to do uh, my talks is to sort of take it back. Um, so I'm going to take it way back uh, to start and talk about the four industrial revolutions. So the first indu industrial revolution was, um, you know, when we have steam powered, focused on automating the agricultural industry, right? For the most part, the people involved in this industry are predominantly white male, um, blue collar workers, right? But then we go into the second industrial revolution. We get into mass production and Henry Ford uh, creates great new and innovative strategies to create products really quickly, so much so that there's a major talent shortage. And we actually have um, African Americans from the South migrating to the Midwest in droves. Um, and a lot of companies trying to just get talent wherever they can in order to keep up with demand. Uh, this also happens as we transition into the third industrial revolution uh, in the information and technology age. So this is literally the first computer. Um, if for any of you that's seen the movie Visible Figures, women were literally called computers um, and did a lot of the original um, computations that now we have uh, computers to do. And we learned that this woman, Dorothy Vaughn, worked for NASA, actually taught herself Fortran. Um, she was the first um, in her division to learn the language um, and even taught others. So this paradigm around technology and IT actually uh, was much more gender balanced um, in the early stages than it is now. So fast forward to the 70s, we have companies like IBM and DEC on the East Coast forming, uh, but it starts to get a little bit more male um, over time as this idea of the technology worker changes. Um, and then we have the big dot-com boom um, in the West Coast, um, where you have a lot of different influence from Stanford, Sun Microsystems, et cetera. Um, and again, gradually over time, this knowledge worker in the technology industry uh, becomes a little bit more homogenous. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how my story fits into this whole um, chain of events. So I was born in 1984 uh, to a single mom who at one point was actually homeless while pregnant with me. She later battled a drug and alcohol addiction, but as fate would have it, she moved in with her sister who was a computer scientist at the University of Maryland College Park in 1984. This is when about a third of all computer science degrees were awarded to women. Uh, so I started coding at 13, was a full stack web developer by 15, took AP computer science and got into Stanford. Um, had a technical internship every summer uh, while I was at Stanford. It was great. I did Society of Women Engineers and all sorts of cool stuff. Studied abroad in Japan. It was great. Um, and then got a call on my cell phone from Microsoft uh, saying, hey, come work for us. Um, so worked there for five years. Um, as you can see, this is my team. Uh, again, not super diverse, but uh, there's a mix. Um, I was based in Charlotte, North Carolina, but I realized there wasn't a lot of growth opportunity for me. Um, it was the first time ever in my career out of college seeing that corporate America wasn't the most meritocratic environment. Um, it wasn't as clear cut what you needed to do to succeed. Uh, and so I quit. I quit Microsoft and went to MIT to get my MBA. Uh, so I got an MBA focused on entrepreneurship and innovation. Started my first company in the travel tech industry called Who and Where. Uh, didn't really take off, so one of my classmates referred me to a position at Google, um, an analytical lead role. And I made it to the final rounds, thought everything was smooth. And uh, they said, nope, sorry. we." Don't think you're quite technical enough, but we're going to hang on to your resume in case some more sales and marketing position opens up. Um, and I said, no, no thanks. I don't think that's really the best fit for me and where I am in my career. So it was cool. And literally the next year, um, these companies were forced to publish their diversity numbers, showing that they were 2% black, 3% Latino, and about 25 to 30% women. And the common narrative was, oh, you know, it's a pipeline problem. We just can't find women and people of color with the degrees that we need. Oh, but we have such a great need. There's such a talent shortage in the tech industry. So 
I literally took my non-technical self and built the first version of Lindor. I locked myself in my mom's basement and taught myself uh, Node.js and Ionic and built a mobile app and started pitching it and moved, to, moved back to Silicon Valley from the East Coast. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about why I've created this product around bias and particularly the impact that it has in identifying uh, the future of workplace talent, which I think in, as we sort of enter this fourth industrial revolution and are experiencing this talent shortage, everyone's sort of focused on automation and the future of work, overcoming your human bias and how you assess people will become more and more important um, to the success of your company. So we know about human bias, right? So they did a study where they sent out two identical resumes, changed the name from Emily to Greg, and it received a 2x difference in response rate. Everything else was completely identical but the name. Um, and we see human bias happening in a few different forms. So affinity bias, which is, hey, you know, I like people who are like me. I like, you know, I hire people who I can go and have a beer with after work. Then there's the halo effect, where we see people with qualities like, oh, he's really tall and attractive, so he must be smart and rich. Um, so basically seeing qualities um, and correlating them uh, to other qual qualities that aren't related. Um, and then confirmation bias, right? We see something, we've seen it a lot, and it inhibits us from actually seeing something different. It's just our natural wiring, our lizard brain, how we've been wired for uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so I also like to show this clip because I think we're really hard on guys about bias. But we need to really understand that this is a human problem and not just a guy problem. So here's a clip of me doing like a Shark Tank pitch um, to a very diverse panel. Let's see if we can get the audio working. To a 60 second elevator ride to pitch the next billion dollar idea to our board of successful investors would like to know how much revenue she has before I shut off an opportunity. You can't deny the marketplace. They're just so mediocre, and you pay money for it. I think there's huge upside. If their pitch is successful, let's open the doors. Let's do it. Welcome to the boardroom. <laughs> Welcome. But if their pitch fails, I think the presentation sucks. Bring, Bring it down. down. Going down. The board has five minutes to make a deal, and you, the viewer, can support your favorite entrepreneur through crowdfunding. This is Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch. Going up. All right, give us another winner. Your 60 seconds begins now. Going up. People suck at judging other people. Yes, even you judging me right now are subject to unconscious bias. Studies have shown that two identical resumes can be sent out with just a name change from Emily to Greg and yield a 2x difference in response rate. So we built a platform that hides candidate name, photo, and age from recruiters while showing that candidates fit score based on skills, education, and experience, and simulta simultaneously measuring how objective hiring managers are in their people decision-making processes to mitigate unconscious bias. We have 57 enterprise customers on the platform and a waiting list of over 450. So we are raising a $1.5 million seed round so that we can grow our sales, operations, and engineering team to build a technology that drives better people decisions based on merit, not most. Three. I really don't think that this is in our Ballywick and I don't believe in the model at all. Me neither. And I would send her down, but that's just... Yeah, I wouldn't want to waste her time. I don't think it's fair. I know you guys are prejudgmental. I'm not. But I seriously, as a businessman, would like to know how much revenue she has before I shut off an opportunity of learning when I promised you I just want a couple minutes of her time. I think this is interesting. I'm willing to spend five minutes and... Yeah, you know, I just we'll, don't want to set the expansion. We're going to spend a million. I don't if we start right, off no, by... Yeah. I promise you. I think we'd be clear. Uh, thank we're you clear guys. about that up front. All right, let's okay. open the door. Welcome to the boardroom. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Welcome to the boardroom. So what's your background? Where are you coming from? So, so 
What was so cool about that video for me is oftentimes we don't get to see the conversations that happen about us in recruiting or venture capital, um, but they're so important to the outcomes of our careers. And particularly when we, when we think about the future of the knowledge worker and how we're assessing talent, it really boils down to who judges you how, when, and who's willing to go to bat for you um, based on very, very limited information um, and internal schemas about what you have. And we oftentimes use proxies like where you went to school, um, the size of the companies that you've worked for, a lot of different metrics, et cetera. But we've, we've really done a poor job of targeting um, and identifying what are the actual skills and characteristics and traits of many different types of people um, that, that we know are correlated to success. So that's human bias. And what we have happening now is the algorithmic bias um, that goes into people decision making. So this is a screenshot of a company called Eightfold.ai, really successful. They raised $24 million. They have all of these cool factors that determine how you fit a job, but some of them are inherently biased, like measuring how quickly you're promoted in, uh, in an existing company, which we know um, women are oftentimes not promoted at the same rate. Um, for equal performance in a company. So using that as a KPI or a statistic in your algorithm is, inherent, is disproportionately affecting certain demographics of people um, and basically amplify, amplifying human bias, right? Because now certain resumes won't even appear um, on your desk if they aren't a minimum score. Um, and I also challenge, as we think about building algorithms to identify talent, how diverse are the teams and the engineers that are going and that are creating um, the code to determine who's a good fit for a job, who's a good um, fit for uh, you know, educational opportunities, et cetera. So what are the business implications? Bloomberg did a really cool thing uh, called Gender Equality Index and correlating it to financial performance. Um, we're working on something similar around um, how we can correlate bias reduction in your people operations. And that's everything from hiring, promotion, compensation, performance reviews. How does that actually tie to business metrics um, and performance over time? Um, and basically, we're trying to model this after the financial services industry. I got an opportunity to meet Daniel Kahneman. He's the uh, uh, econ guy who run the Nobel Prize around behavioral economics, particularly how we naturally just make really bad decisions when it comes to finance. We have this trigger reaction to um, hate loss more than we love gains. And the same sort of wiring is happening when we think about people, but we've yet to really capture people analytics in the way um, that we do in the financial services industry. Um, so what are solutions? So I'll talk a little bit briefly like what we're doing in this space. So part of it is sourcing. Uh, we're crowdsourcing as much talent, as much diverse talent as possible in an automated way so that we can build uh, machine learning algorithms that are figuring out um, who is a good fit for a role based on the feedback that we see around who's successful. So not just simply what school you went to, how long you've been, um, in a role, promoted, et cetera. Um, but maybe there are other characteristics uh, that correlate to why you're good for sales or why you're a good senior um, in software engineer. Um, and then the other part, as mentioned, removing name, um, age, any indication of race, gender, nat nationality, disability, sexual orientation, et cetera, and focusing your attention on the things that are actually relevant, um, and integrating with your applicant tracking systems and HRIS, so you can sort of see over time how, how far different demographics of qualified candidates make it in your funnel. And then the last piece is accountability. My favorite article is Harvard Business Review, Why Diversity Programs Fail. Um, the reality is, and this is why I like to start with the context of the Industrial Revolutions, there weren't really any diversity programs that got women into factories. It was just needed. We needed the talent, right? And we're in the same position now, and I think we have to focus our energies less on creating unconscious bias training programs that people don't really want to be in, and focus on how we create the business case and how we drive accountability for things like board representation, um, and what programs and initiatives companies are doing and how it's actually helping their business overall. So we're working with SAP Success Factors. They've created this whole business beyond bias program um, because they realize the actual cost, the opportunity cost of not addressing the missed talent um, because of the algorithmic bias and systems and processes that you're currently using um, for your people operations. So we focus really on solutions that are scalable, measurable, and accountable. Um, I like to 
in with this uh, because we we love all these big tech guys and we're you know we we understand a bit of their trajectory and we focus all of a lot of our attention on getting people into STEM education and going to the right schools. But if you peel back the layers, a lot of these guys don't have a college degree, don't have a computer science degree, um, even though they're hiring people from the schools with the degrees. Um, that they claim will be will help with innovation. And I think particularly the industry that claims to be the most innovative, we have to think a little bit more creatively about what signals we're using to say who's good and who's not. Biggest example of this is this guy, right? Read college dropout, physics major, I think he did some poetry and literature, some calligraphy here and there. Um, but we allowed him as the uh, most innovative guy in the world. And I actually had an opportunity to go to the White House Demo Day a couple years ago, and someone gave me some really great inspiration around how we think about the future of workforce talent. And I'm gonna make sure we have sound. There's some sound in this. Cool. Next Steve Jobs might be named Stephanie. <laughs> Next Steve Jobs might be named Stephanie. Awesome. <laughs> That's 